Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan, for a very kind introduction. And it's a great honour to give this Jean Mott lecture. Um, I'm going to talk about ageing, which is nonetheless, I think, of relevance to young scientists because it's actually a field of research that's expanding quite rapidly at the moment. A lot of um, new group leaders are setting up in the area. And I think there are two main reasons for that. One is that there's a very strong pull from public policy, um, basically because of rising human life expectancy. Illustrated here, it was a trend that started in most developed countries in the beginning of the 19th century, and it's been going on at a very steady rate ever since, about two and a half years per decade. So it's illustrated here for the country that was the world leader at the time. Um, so that tended to be the Scandinavian countries early on. At the moment, it's um, Hong Kong and Japan, respectively, for men and women. They have the highest uh, life expectancies at the moment. And the point of this article at the time it was written was to um, demonstrate that there's no clear signature at the moment coming from the demographic data of what the intrinsic limit on human lifespan is going to turn out to be. There isn't any obvious approaching wall of death here. Although, of course, secular trends with um, the increase in diabetes and metabolic disease, particularly amongst the young, may have an effect on, on how this actually plays out in the future. And I think this is something to be celebrated um, because of improvements in lifestyle and medical care. People are staying healthier as they get older, and so they're living longer. Um, but it's coming with something of a negative press, partly for economic reasons. Um, workforce participation is, is lower in older people, so there are economic issues um, between generations. Um, but perhaps of, of more direct relevance for this audience is this one which is that age, advancing age, is the major risk factor for what are now the chronic and killer diseases, not just of developed, uh, but also of developing countries. So these are actually various EU and UK statistics, and you can see this very strong and well-known increase in incidence with age. So the increased survival with age is unmasking the fact that ageing is a risk factor for these diseases. And one obvious approach, since age is the major risk factor, would be to try and tackle these diseases by intervening in the underlying aging process itself. So instead of dealing with them piecemeal, to try and deal with the common cause of all of them, if they have common etiologies from the aging process. But until quite recently, the prospects for doing that have looked poor, essentially because aging is such a complex process. Um, so this is just an illustration of various human tissues and some of the things that can go wrong in them as people get older. And what we see is a great diversity of damage and pathology, both within a single tissue and in different tissues in the body. It looks here as though there is no simple underlying aging process that we could intervene into with environmental methods or with um, genetic alterations. Rather, what we're seeing here is a process of parallel accumulation of damage and pathology as the individual gets older. And by the same token, I think for a long time, it was assumed that these laboratory model organisms would age very differently from each other. For a start, they have very different lifespans, about three weeks in the worm, three months in the fly, three years in the mouse but also very different diets, metabolism, ways of life. Why should the kinds of insults of daily living that they encounter be the same or even uh, very overlapping with each other? And of course, if that were true, it would mean that for aging, the normal process of trying to understand um, a simple organism for the mechanisms of whatever um, process it is one's interested in, and then proceeding to the more complex mammals and eventually humans, would not be possible. It would be closed off for ageing. And I think the other reason that the science of ageing is actually expanding at the moment is the realisation that at least to some extent, those very pessimistic um, assumptions turn out to be false. So for a start, the ageing process is clearly malleable, both to environmental and genetic interventions. Um, this is an example in the worm where it was uh, first discovered uh, by somebody called Michael Klass. He did a simple chemical mutagenesis experiment and he asked if he could recover long-lived strains of worms and he found that he could. Um, this is one of these uh, mutants cleaned up and actually measured for lifespan in the lab of my colleague David Gems. 
And it took a while, but in the mid-90s, uh, these mutations were cloned and sequenced, and they turned out to encode an, a worm insulin IGF-like signaling pathway, of course much better known in mammals for its effects on metabolism and growth, respectively. But here it is turning up in the worm, important in controlling lifespan. This is a hypomorphic mutation in the single worm insulin IGF-1 receptor. And so knockdown of activity of the pathway increases lifespan. But there were various reasons, because of its developmental effects, um, for assuming that this might be a worm peculiarity. Uh, but the other important thing that turned up is that the mechanisms, at least this particular mechanism, shows quite strong evolutionary conservation. So these are survival curves now for Drosophila, for a mutant in the single insulin receptor substrate, and in the mouse for one of the insulin receptor substrates, both null mutations. You can see the nice um, increase in lifespan in both of them. In the fly, you can also see the effect of the mutation on growth and body size. The homozygous females are actually dwarf, but we know that those are two separate effects of the pathway. The animal doesn't have to be small in order to live long. We can allow it to grow um, to full size and then knock down insulin IGF signaling in the adult phase and still see the extension of lifespan. And, of course, what we're interested in here, because this is essentially an applied exercise uh, hoping to find ways of improving human health during aging, is that there's an improvement in function and health. Lifespan is, is an important and easy to measure output, but what we're interested in is improved function during aging. And I'll just show you some of the data for this mutant mouse, because I think they showed what we really weren't expecting to find, which is a very broad spectrum improvement in health during aging. So although these uh, mutant IRS1 mice here on the left um, actually start life slightly insulin resistant when they're young, they look as though they might get diabetes as they get older. In fact, as they go through middle and old age, they show greatly improved uh, glucose handling, a better immune, proof immune profile, they've got more naive T cells, um, their rotor rod performance is maintained better with age, and they also show delayed onset of these aging-related pathologies, so they get less osteoporosis. Um, you can see the cataract in the control mouse on the right, so those two are litimates, sisters, at the age of about 800 days. And about 40% of these controls get this ulcerative dermatitis that you can see on the head and nape here as they go through aging. These little IRS1 mice are completely protected. We've never seen a case, even with high fat feeding. So what we're seeing here is a broad spectrum improvement in health during aging that's associated also with the increase in lifespan. So I think that's why these, these mutants um, are of some interest. Of course, what we would like to know is whether similar things are happening in humans. And at the moment, the way that's being examined is by looking at genetic variation at the human orthologs of the genes that have been shown to be important in the laboratory animals, uh, rather than GWAS. The reason is um, sample size. Um, what we're looking at usually is association with survival to advanced ages, so we need a well-documented study population with the appropriate controls. And some quite interesting things are turning up there. It's still very early days, and there's a lot of work going on in this area. Um, but one of the consistent associations in several different studies now has been with this FOXO3A. And the reason that's interesting is that it's one of the mammalian 4 ked box o transcription factors, and it's been demonstrated experimentally in both the worm and the fly that the single 4 ked box o transcription factor is required for the extension of lifespan by reduced insulin signaling. If that gene's deleted, the animal is viable, but its lifespan is no longer extended by reduced insulin signaling. And interestingly, both FOXO3 and FOXO1, one of the other FOXO transcription factors, seem to be associated with survival to advanced stages in humans. Also, genetic variants in the IGF-1 receptor have turned up um, to be important, and they also explain some of the natural genetic variation in lifespan amongst mouse strains in the lab. Um, I've put in these two ladies at the bottom um, simply to make 
a point about centenarians, um, because they're, they're very interesting phenotypically. Um, in terms of lifestyle, they're no more likely to have healthy habits than people who don't live so long. So they're no less likely to smoke um, or to be obese or to take exercise. And they also don't have an abnormally low load of mutations that are known to be associated with aging-related disease. There seems to be something, something else going on with their survival to these very advanced ages. So what we have here is a systemic signaling pathway that detects nutritional status and also to some extent stress and growth factors and matches the costly activities of the organism, its growth, its metabolism, its reproduction to its current status. And this signaling network is very closely associated with a much more ancient intracellular part of the network which is the tall signaling pathway. And again, genetic variants in this pathway have been shown to be associated uh, with survival to advanced stages in laboratory animals, actually including mice. Um, so we've got this whole uh, nutrition sensing signaling network that turns out to be important in aging. And the TOR part is particularly interesting because it's allowed a proof of principle that we can pharmacologically inhibit signaling in the same way and see the output of reduced aging. So this has come out of the um, National Institute of Aging Intervention Testing Program in the US. What they do is to accept a certain number of, of drugs or nutrients each year and put them into a testing program that's done in three different centers. And these were the results for rapamycin, which is, of course, a potent and specific inhibitor of TOR kinase by disrupting its association with one of the other proteins that it complexes with. And you can see that in both sexes of mice, there's quite a nice increase in lifespan. This was published about five years ago now. We now know that uh, with other doses of rapamycin, we can actually get a much bigger effect than this. These, these are quite subtle effects, but this was just a first attempt with a single dose. And it's a much lower dose than is used therapeutically. So rapamycin is a licensed drug for human use. It's on license uses are as an immunosuppressant, a cancer chemotherapeutic, and to prevent restenosis after cardiac surgery. But as you would expect for a drug that might be interfering with the aging process, it's actually turning out to have a much broader therapeutic range in experimental studies. Um, so for example, it, it's been shown here, um, this was a study looking at the effects of age on response to vaccination against flu virus in mice. And uh, in short, what they found on the right is that if you vaccinate an old mouse and then challenge it with flu virus, it's no more protected than a young mouse that hasn't been um, vaccinated at all. So basically, the vaccine doesn't work very well at all, at all in older mice. What they found was that if they pre-fed the mice with rapamycin, then they took the response right up to the level of young mice, and it turned out to be through an effect on the hematopoietic stem cells. Also, repeatedly, this is just one example, many studies now have shown that rapamycin is protective in genetic models of neurodegenerative disease, particularly ones associated with proteotoxicity. So this is an Alzheimer's case, but people have also looked at alpha-synuclein and polyglutamine repeats, and rapamycin is clearly protective there. So th there's a lot of interest in, in rapamycin and the kinds of effects that it's having. And also some small-scale clinical trials are starting with much lower doses than the clinically approved ones um, for use in older age groups. This was just one that was reported in Science just before the turn of the year last year. And in this study, they're looking at mobility and cognitive impairment. And so far, what's been reported from the study is that at these low doses, there are no reported side effects of the drug, which is encouraging. But what the effects will be um, remains to be seen. So at this point, I'd like to um, sing the joys of uh, working with the fruit fly, Drosophila, which is where I do quite a bit of my own research, um, for making fairly rapid progress with trying to unravel some of the mechanisms that are involved in the action of these interventions. So just taking the case of rapamycin, um, it also extends lifespan in flies. You can see the dose-dependent effect on survival here. This was a study done by Ivana Bedoff, who was a postdoc at UCL. She now has her own lab at the UCL Cancer Institute. And what she could do, because it was flies, was fairly rapidly do the epistasis between the drug and specific genetic mutations to inquire which bits 
of the TOR signalling network were important for the effects on lifespan. And what she found was that the increase in autophagy that occurs when you inhibit TOR was required. If she blocked it, it had no effect on the wild-type flies, but it prevented the increase in lifespan with rapamycin. Um, it also requires the reduced activity of the S6 kinase, which is a direct target of TOR kinase. But I think to our surprise, 4-EBP, which is um, intimately involved in the control of protein translation uh, by the TOR network, was not required at all. Flies that were completely null for 4-EBP responded perfectly normally. So I think Drosophila can be useful, although of course we always want to know if these mechanisms are also going on in mammals. So the attentions of the field, I think, in, in this area are um, directed to some fairly obvious questions. I mean, how exactly do we need to alter the signalling domain to get the outputs that we want, improved health during ageing? And because there's so much feedback in the network, it may well be optimal to interfere at more than one point. So there's quite a bit of work on that going on. There's also a question about um, dose and timing, obviously. Um, Crucially, what are the downstream outputs? Are we looking at changes in autophagy? Is it um, the proteasomal degradation system, cellular detoxification mechanisms, more systemic effects? What are the mechanisms that are actually improving health, which are highly likely to be tissue-specific? So there's a lot of work going on in different tissues asking about the effects of reduced activity of the network. Um, and is it going to be possible to use drugs to promote human health during aging? And if so, when should they be taken? Can we start late, or do they have to be taken throughout life? Is there a, a history effect of use of the drug, or is it completely acute? That's something that's being studied with rapamycin at the moment. And then what's the connection between reduced activity of this network and the ageing-related diseases that it's been shown to ameliorate, including actually models of cancer? So what I want to talk about for the rest of today is something that I hoped would interest this audience, which is reduced insulin signaling in the nervous system. Because this is a tissue where there's been a particular argument about the possible effects of reduced insulin IGF signaling, and whether it be beneficial or harmful, or a mixture of both under different circumstances. And there's been some quite thoughtful um, discussion in the literature about it. And the arguments go as follows. If you ask uh, most neurologists, they'd say, reduced insulin IGF signaling in the brain, bad, because IGFs are neuroprotective, so they're definitely key to defense after various forms of brain injury. Obviously, insulin, particularly in the hypothalamus, informs about um, current nut nutritional status, and hence energy acquisition and allocation is controlled. And both IGF-1 and insulin have been reported, at least, to be effective in animal models and, to some extent, clinical trials of human neurodegeneration, although I'd say the evidence on that point is considerably weaker than on the other two. But on the other hand, as we've already seen for rapamycin, it's clear that if you blunt insulin IGF-2 signaling, you can reduce the pathology in many different animal models of neurodegenerative diseases, particularly ones associated with prox uh, proteotoxicity. And these are just three of the first studies that came out in mice making this point. So they've all reduced insulin and IGF signaling in different ways. They've used different models of Alzheimer's disease in the mice, and they've all found a protective effect. Although at this stage, the detailed mechanisms involved um, were not investigated. So the two examples I'd like to talk about are, first of all, age-related degeneration of a neural circuit. So this is a very specific part of the fly nervous system, and I'm going to describe what happens to it during aging and the effects of reduced insulin signaling thereon. I'll then come to a much more distributed uh, feature of the nervous system, which is its control of sleep, and particularly age-related sleep fragmentation. So first of all, this neural circuit. And I should say straight away that this work was only possible because of this postdoc, Crevé Augustin, who came to join the lab at UCL with a very strong background in neuroscience and electrophysiology, and really, he's the one who's led the charge on this project. And what he wanted was a system that he could interrogate electrophysiologically to get a functional output so that he could see what was happening during aging and the effects of reduced insulin signaling. And the one that he chose is this giant fiber system in the fly. So it mediates the escape responses of the fly to frightening visual stimuli. It depresses its legs and flies away. And key to it is this giant interneuron with the giant fiber, uh, which synapses either with interneurons or directly with motor neurons that innervate the turgotrochanteral muscle, which depresses the leg, uh, 
or the dorsal longitudinal muscle, which is the indirect uh, flight muscle in the fly. And there's a mixture of electrical gap junctional synapses and chemical um, cholinergic synapses in this system. So the first thing he did was to simply ask whether it has had been previously reported in the literature, transmission through the system um, gets impaired with age. And he found that it did. So what we've got here is a stimulus delivered to the eye of the fly, and this is the response latency, the length of time it takes to get to the recording electrodes in the two sets of muscles. And you can see that there's this uh, steady increase in response latency with age. So the first thing he asked was, well, can I ameliorate this uh, loss of response speed with age if I reduce insulin signaling? And he found that if you reduced it in neurons generally, so the way that we can alter um, gene expression in the fly is using the yeast GAL4 UAS system, which allows you to misexpress a gene um, in a specific tissue and if you use an inducible driver at a specific time. And what he found was that if he knocked down insulin signaling in adult neurons generally, then he could greatly rescue this loss of transmission with age. And fortunately for us, there's a GAL4 driver that's expressed specifically in this giant fiber system. It's illustrated on the left here. Um, you can see its pattern of expression with a reporter construct. So you can see the giant fiber in blue and then um, where all those synapses happen at the side. And what you can see on the right is if he uses that to drive a dominant negative version of the insulin receptor, so knock down insulin signaling just in the circuit, he sees um, the normal increase in response latency with age in the genetic controls, but it's actually completely abolished if he knocks down insulin signaling. So he's done a lot of work trying to understand what's happening in these neurons to produce this effect. And as far as he can see, there's no change in the cholinergic part of the system with age, and I'm not going to talk about it. But what there clearly is a change in is the gap junctional part. So in the fly, the gap junctions um, are made of a protein called shaking, shaking B. It's an invertebrate in exin, and uh, we've got quite a good antibody for it. And what you can see on the left is sustaining in old and young control and insulin mutant flies. And the top end, the anterior end of the fly, is going up the slide. So there's an anterior medial staining, which doesn't seem to be affected by age. But then there's this pair of lateral tracts posteriorly. And in the wild-type flies, you can see on the right, um, they gradually lose staining uh, with age, whereas this does not happen in the mutant. The midline region seems to be unaffected by aging. And those lateral tracts are where all that synapsing happens with the interneurons and motor neurons. So Augie wondered if he put shaking B, the protein that forms these gap junctions, back into the system genetically, would it rescue the loss of transmission with age? And again, same type of uh, slide format here, he found that it did. He could completely rescue the loss of transmission. So it looks as though somehow loss of shaking B is the problem. And it's known, partly by analogy with mammals, um, that these gap junctional proteins are recycled by two mechanisms. One's through the ubiquitin proteasome system, um, the other is through endocytic recycling. And it's well established in the literature that proteasomal activity in the fly declines with age. And another lab has also shown that if one overexpresses a particular subunit of the proteasome, one of the CAP subunits, then you can increase proteasomal activity. So Augie did this to see if increasing proteasomal activity would rescue the transmission. And again, he found that it would. There's almost no loss of transmission with age if he overexpresses this proteasomal subunit. So an obvious hypothesis here is that what reduced insulin signaling is doing is increasing proteasomal activity, but that turns out not to be the case. So on the right here, what we have is the output of an in vitro measurement of proteasomal activity. We see the decrease with age that's been widely reported in the literature, but no effect at all of knocking down insulin signaling on the level of activity. It's rather a crude assay, admittedly, but there's no hint here that insulin signaling is affecting that part of the system. So we turned our attention instead to this endocytic uh, recycling machinery, which depends on a series of um, target-specific RAB GTPases that can rapidly recycle proteins back to the cell membrane or target them eventually to the lysosome for degradation. 
And we wondered if reduced insulin signaling was affecting the expression of this pathway. So we simply went back and looked at some of our RNA transcript profiles for brains of flies in insulin mutant and saw what we'd overlooked before, which is that there's actually quite wholesale upregulation of specific RABs in this pathway. So we obtained antibodies for um, those proteins where the antibody cross-reacts in the fly and simply had a look at what age and reduced insulin signaling do to the expression of the proteins. And that's shown here, and you can see that for uh, three of them, Rab4, Rab5, and Dynamin, there's a, a distinct effect of insulin signaling on the expression of the proteins. So it's just in old flies for Rab4, in both young and old flies for Rab5, and just in old flies for Dynamin. So this may be a compensatory response to the effects of um, loss of proteasomal activity. What we don't see in wild-type flies is any effect of age on expression of this system. There's no evidence that it itself goes down with the age of the fly. But since it increases its expression in insulin mutants, Orki finally asked, well, what happens if I genetically overexpress these RABs in the giant fiber system? And that's shown here for uh, RAB4 in the middle and RAB5 on the right. The controls are on the left, just showing the normal increase in response latency with age. What he finds is that if he overexpresses simply a wild-type version of either RAB, he prevents the age-related increase. On the other hand, if he does RNA interference against the RAB, he can um, replicate the increase in response latency that's normally associated with age in young flies. And if he overexpresses a constitutively active version of RAB4, then he can actually improve um, conduction through the system. So at least uh, for insulin signaling in this part of the fly system, it's clear that loss of conductivity with age can be rescued, um, that the decline seems to be caused mainly by loss of the gap junction, slightly explained by lower proteasomal activity. And what lowered insulin signaling does is to increase expression of the endocytic recycling machinery, which can rescue loss of conductivity. And I think what we need to know about this now is how general an effect it is. Is it fly-specific? Is it nervous system-specific? I mean, quite likely that what we're seeing here is a side effect of the feedback in the insulin pathway itself, because the insulin receptor is degraded through this system, or recycled through this system, and FOXO, the key transcription factor, is degraded in association with it. So it may well be that in the course of feedback on the insulin signaling itself, it's taking other cell membrane proteins with it in which case it could be quite a general effect. So finally, I'd like to talk about sleep and age-related sleep fragmentation. So during aging in humans, um, loss of sleep quality is a major problem. First of all, it's extremely common. Uh, many people over the age of 65 have problems with sleep, both getting to sleep and maintaining sleep once it's started. And sleep becomes fragmented. Characteristically, people start falling asleep during the day. Um, they sleep less at night, and when they do fall asleep, it's in shorter, interrupted bouts of sleep, which are less likely to go into the deep sleep phase of the sleep cycle. And that, that's very well documented in humans. And Drosophila actually has some similarities with human sleep um, that have proved quite useful. So it's defined in the flies less, uh, more than five minutes without any movement. And flies sleep more at night, like humans, they're um, diurnal. Uh, and as the sleep bout proceeds, they get harder to wake up, and there are electrophysiological changes that have been recorded in the brain, and there are also changes in gene expression during a sleep bout. Um, as in humans, there's homeostatic regulation, so if you prevent the fly from sleeping, it will sleep more afterwards. There's rebound uh, sleep. They show the same pattern of age-related sleep fragmentation as humans do. This has been reported in the literature. So they sleep more at, during the day, less at night, and in shorter bouts. And many of the same drugs and signaling pathways turn out to be important in control of the fly sleep. So um, caffeine, amphetamines, octopamine, which is the fly equivalent of not epinephrine, and dopamine all promote waking and activity in the fly. So we were interested in this age-related sleep fragmentation and the effects of reduced insulin signaling thereon. And this has actually just, just been published. And these are the three postdocs who, who did the work here. Um, Thanos, who initiated the project, and Luke Tain and Sebastian Gronke, who, who took it on in its later stages. So it's pretty easy to um, measure sleep, as defined in the 
Drosophila just using an automated measuring system. So the flies go into these tubes that are shown on the left with food and a bung, and they cross a, a beam so you can measure activity that way. You can put drugs in the food, you can also alter the nutrient content of the food, the light cycle to which they're exposed, and so on. You, you can uh, manipulate a lot of environmental factors. And there are many different outputs that can be measured. So the circadian rhythm of the fly, either in light, dark, or, or free run. Um, the activity of individual flies on the left, or um, group statistics on the right, um, the amount of sleep done at different times of day. Um, there, there are many different ways that one can analyze the data that come in from this. And because of the very close association between sleep and circadian rhythm, the first thing we did was to ask whether um, insulin mutants show an altered circadian rhythm if we put them into free run in constant dark. And we found that there was no effect at all on the period. Their free run periods seem to be unaffected, although there, there may be other effects, but the, the period of the circadian rhythm is unaffected. Uh, but what's very clear is that this diurnal pattern of activity that the flies show is greatly exaggerated in the insulin mutants, even when they're young. Um, so this is shown here. This DILK23 is loss of three of the fly insulin ligands. Um, flies make these three ligands actually in their brain. They have a set of neurosecretory cells that are very like a pancreas in their brain, and they produce these three ligands. If we knock them out, the fly lives a very long time. And you can see this great, greatly exaggerated diurnal activity and night inactivity, and also um, exaggerated sleep patterns. They sleep less than wild types during the day and more at night. And as I say, this is present even in young flies. Sorry, this is the sleep slide. It's um, on a separate slide. So as I mentioned, flies show this age-related um, sleep fragmentation. So what we've got here in relation to age is the amount of activity at night, and you can see that it goes up. The amount of sleep goes down, and the number of sleep bouts go up, and correspondingly, the bouts of sleep get shorter. Um, these slides rapidly get extremely data heavy, so I'm not going to show every phenotype every time. But we clearly see this pattern of sleep fragmentation with age in the wild type flies that's been reported before. So, of course, what we did was to measure what happens to sleep as the flies get older in insulin mutants. And this is the story for the DILK235. So, as I've mentioned, they already show phenotypes when they're young. But what you can see is that this age related change is either completely abolished or barely occurs as the mutants get older. So their sleep pattern is maintained, much more, and activity pattern is maintained much more strongly with age. So we were interested in the mechanisms controlling this. These same flies also um, show uh, sleep fragmentation during the day. The wild types sleep more by day, and again, insulin signaling reduces um, that effect. And it's not just confined to this mutant. We've looked at several different insulin pathway mutants, and they all show um, a similar effect. So, we, of course, we're interested in mechanisms. Um, this is the signaling network in the fly. It's considerably uh, simpler than in mammals. They tend to be just one of everything, where there are four in mammals. Uh, but flies produce more ligands. There are seven insulin-like ligands. You can then see the canonical um, insulin signaling pathway and the tor part of the network down uh, towards the left. There's FOXO, which shuttles in and out of the nucleus, dependent on the upstream activity of the canonical part of the insulin signaling pathway. And uh, what came as a great surprise to us is that it turns out that the effects of reduced insulin signaling on the day sleep and activity and on the night sleep and activity are controlled in completely different ways. So it's not that the insulin mutants are very much more um, active by day, so by the time the night comes, they're exhausted and they sleep more. There's no connection between the day and the night phenotypes. They're completely independently controlled and by different bits of this signaling network. So it turned out that the day activity phenotypes require that forkhead transcription factor that's also required for the increase in lifespan. They're mediated by something called adipokinetic hormone, which I'll explain in a minute, and octopamine, this fly, norepinephrine. Whereas it seems to be the tall part of the network that's important for the night sleep phenotypes, and it acts through altered activity of the dopamine pathway. So first of all, this adipokinetic hormone, it's essentially the equivalent, but not the orthologue, of mammalian glycogen. So it's the starvation hormone. It acts antagonistically to some of the fly insulins. It increases the activity of the fly um, if it's present at higher levels. 
and uh, it increases expression in flies that have lost their insulin-producing cells or their insulin-like ligands. So it's an obvious candidate for mediating uh, some of these effects. So what we simply asked was, well, what happens if we delete the receptor for adipokinetic hormone? There's a single adipokinetic hormone receptor in the fly. If you delete it, the fly is viable. So what we asked was, well, what happens to these sleep phen phenotypes if we take it out? And for day activity... Um, you can see here that um, you've got the increase in activity in the uh, DILT mutant, and then what happens if we take the receptor out in a wild-type fly, and it has no effect. However, what it does do is to block the increase in day activity in the mutant if we combine the two with each other. So that rather strongly suggests that the effect is actually going through this receptor. There are no effects at all on the night sleep phenotypes. This is highly specific. So the effects of this pathway are circadian gated by mechanisms that we don't understand at the mutant at the moment. And also, um, we know that in cockroaches, although this hasn't been explored in Drosophila, the way that adipokinetic hormone increases the activity of the animal is specifically through activation of the receptor on the cells that produce octopamine, this fly norepinephrine. So it's the AKH receptor on the octopaminergic cells that seems to be important. So what we did was to ask whether that was also the case in the fly. So the first thing we did was simply to look at whether there's any change in levels of octopamine using mass spec. And you can see that there is indeed an increase in octopamine levels if we knock down insulin signaling if we remove the AKH uh, receptor, it has no effect on the wild types, but again, it blocks that increase in levels of octopamine um, when we knock down insulin signaling. So it looks as though this may be the mechanism by which it's mediating uh, the effects on the day phenotypes. And we can test for that by using pharmacological um, manipulation. It's meanserin, which actually inhibits um, octopaminergic signaling. It blocks... Um, the octopamine-induced cyclic AMP increase in the receptor cells. And we see all of the same things if we do that. So the increase in day activity with um, the mutant completely abolished if we feed them with meanserin, and no effect on the night sleep phenotypes. So at least for the day phenotypes, there seems to be a fairly clear um, pathway involved and the mechanisms are reasonably well understood. For the night sleep phenotypes, exactly what's going on is less clear, although certain aspects of it are. So it's clearly mediated through the TOR pathway, because if we feed the flies rapamycin, we can recapitulate the night sleep phenotypes of insulin mutants. So this is shown here in young flies, 10 days old, and you can see there's no effect on their day activity if we feed them rapamycin, but they sleep more at night, they have fewer sleep bouts, and those sleep bouts are longer. And because it's a drug, um, one of the really interesting things about it, of course, is to ask, well, when do we need to give the flies the drug? Can we wait till they're old and already in sleep fragmentation so we don't induce these sleep phenotypes in the younger animals? We avoid that because they're not necessarily desirable, but we simply tackle the age-related fragmentation that occurs early on. And it turns out that rapamycin does seem to act pretty acutely to induce these phenotypes. So this is what happens if we feed it to flies when they're 40 d 45 days old. So this is the time where they're really starting to, to die off. They're in late, middle age, um, early, old age. And if we feed them rapamycin for just two days, we can recapitulate uh, the, this effect on the night sleep of the flies, which I think is interesting. And one obvious mechanism, one, one candidate mechanism for the effect of rapamycin and TOR signaling um, was through an effect on dopamine, um, because it's very well known that dopamine is extremely important and reduced dopamine signaling at night is important in the control of Drosophila sleep. So what we asked was, well, what happens if we knock down dopamine signaling um, by using a mutation in the uh, fly dopamine receptor. It's not a complete knockout. It's a very hypomorphic mutation in the receptor. And what we find if we do that is that, first of all, the knockout itself recapitulates the night sleep uh, phenotypes of um, flies that are uh, fed rapamycin, but that there's then no further increase in those phenotypes if we feed rapamycin to the mutant. So again, it looks as though they're epistatic to each other. So we had a very uh, hard look at the dopaminergic system of these flies, 
I'm, I'm sure this is very familiar to this audience, but of course dopamine comes from the presynaptic neuron, there's a receptor, and there's also a reuptake transporter in the presynaptic neuron which removes the dopamine from the cleft. We found there's no change in the dopamine levels themselves in the fly, and we can't detect any changes in the biosynthetic enzymes in the pathway to dopamine, so that seems to be unaffected. And nor could we find any change in the expression levels of the receptor. They don't seem to be involved. But was, what was very clear was that there was a change in the expression of the transporter. This is the transporter messenger RNA. And you can see that its expression is greatly increased, both in the presence of rapamycin, to a very similar extent in the DILT235 mutant. And again, if we feed rapamycin to the mutant, we don't see any further increase. So that implicates dopamine signaling, and we looked at it um, more directly, pharmacologically, um, using two chemicals. So 3 iodoyl tyrosine actually inhibits tyrosine hydroxylase and hence dopamine uh, synthesis, and methamphetamine, uh, which prevents dopamine clearance from the synaptic cleft and, in fact, induces the transporter to work in the reverse direction, so it greatly increases uh, dopamine signaling. And both of them, in opposite directions, um, abolished the effect of reduced insulin signaling on the, night on the night phenotypes of the fly. So we need to understand in more detail what's going on in this part of the system, I think, but it's very clear what the basic uh, mechanism involved is. So to conclude this bit, lowered insulin signaling can reduce age-related sleep fragmentation, and for the night sleep phenotypes, it can do it even when it's induced at late ages. Um, it seems to be, for the day phenotypes, basically a starvation story and an increase in activity with um, AKH and hence octopamine production. And reduced TOR and dopamine signaling are responsible for the night sleep uh, consolidation, although we've got a bit more work to do there to understand the exact mechanisms. So I think the nervous system is probably a little different from other tissues. Yes, IGF and insulin have informative and, in the case of IGF um, repair functions in specific tissues under specific circumstances. But this effect of chronic lowered signaling through the network seems to be a somewhat different one that induces a number of protective responses in cells that are possibly uh, tissue specific. There's an awful lot of detail still to be worked out here. Um, but it's clear that many different aspects of cellular function are altered by reduced insulin and TOR signaling, and they can be beneficial for the way that that tissue ages. And I don't think the nervous system's any different. And I think the way that people are therefore starting to think about this area is that we may be able to treat the underlying aging process to treat the diseases of aging. So we'd be looking here at preventative medicine, I think, rather than waiting until after the disease has developed. Um, possibly a cocktail of drugs, some of which exist already. We've seen that rapamycin has very broad spectrum effects. It's turning out that also metformin, uh, which is the main line of defense against type 2 diabetes now, or at least the initial line of defense, is also highly protective against various cancers. Even the humble aspirin is turning out to have much broader spectrum effects. So I, I think reuse of old drugs will be part of it, but also probably um, some new drugs as well. And finally, it's a great uh, pleasure to acknowledge um, our funders. And also, th this was a joint lab retreat between several labs um, this summer, showing um, the group from UCL that works on aging and also um, my group at the Max Planck Institute are part of it. And the red uh, bolts are against the three postdocs, so Augie, who did the giant fiber system, and Sebastian and Luke on the right, who are involved um, in the sleep work. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.